Hi, everyone. <laughs> My name is Timothy Gager, and welcome to Virtual Friday's Dire Literary Series. And tonight, my guest is Maggie Darty, who has written a fascinating book called The Equivalence. And we're going to hear from her and also get to chat with her for a bit. Um, what uh, I can tell you about, uh, about Maggie here, if you want to read along from home is uh, Maggie is a writer of literary criticism, reviews, essays, has her work has been in the New Yorker, the New York Times, the New York Review of Books, The Equivalence. The book, her first book was published in May on 2020. And, um, you know, you can read all about it, as it says here, but best of all, uh, if you Google Maggie or go to scholar.harvard.edu slash mdarty, you'll find this website. And there is some great stuff in here and you can check out the book. And I went into a big, big rabbit hole when I was um, looking at uh, this book. And it was a great rabbit hole to go into. So uh, without anything else for me, let's turn it over to Maggie Doherty. Um, thanks so much, Tim. Thank you for having me and for organizing this event. Um, it's really exciting just to, you know, I published this book in May 2020, so obviously not ideal timing in so far as events and gatherings and readings and all of that. So it's just been so great uh, to see people have these other ways of getting people together to, um, to talk about books. Um, so, so I guess I'll read a little bit from, um, from my book, which I have here, um, wonderfully designed cover that has both the uh, images and art by some of the women in this book. Um, so my book's about a circle of women artists and writers who came together in Cambridge in the early 1960s at the Radcliffe Institute for Independent Study, which was this fellowship program for mothers, basically. It was a way to get married women who had had children, but who had some sort of scholarly ambitions, creative ambitions, artistic ambitions. It was a way to get them into a university setting where they could have office space, they could access resources, they could meet each other. Um, and give them a chance to come together in the kind of community that wasn't very common um, in the mid-century, wasn't really usual for women artists and academics to have a space where they could meet up and collaborate. So what I'll read, um, I'm actually going to read something I haven't read before, um, but felt sort of compelling to me in this moment for some reason, um, a moment of the kind of collaboration that took place among these women, among these writers and artists at um, the Institute. And I'm gonna read about uh, the painter Barbara Swan, who was actually working on lithographs um, during her time at the Institute, and the poet Anne Sexton, who ended up embarking on a long-term collaboration where Swan would illustrate Sexton's poems, would draw covers for her books. But, um, but the, the moment I'll read today is a little bit different. Um, it's a sort of stranger moment of collaboration, but I think it's, it's really interesting. So. On May 1st, 1962, Swan gave a seminar talk on her lithographs, a small visual essay, she called it. Her pieces were strewn about the seminar room at 78 Mount Auburn Street, where they caught the afternoon light. The size of the pieces made it clear that lithography was indeed backbreaking labor, as Swan said, pronouncing the last word like a true New Englander. She introduced the audience with the components and techniques of her chosen medium. You draw on the stone, she explained, then etch it with acid so the white parts will be covered in the black released by the pressing. Lithography was remarkable because an artist could revise the piece in between prints. Unlike painters who simply covered up prior versions with more paint, these artists revealed their process, their errors, revisions, and redirections. She paused over a piece called The Musicians, which was inspired by a line of Keats. Heard melodies are sweet, but those unheard are sweeter. This had been one of her first efforts in the medium. Two figures playing wind instruments are set against a murky background, a fitting way to figure music. The women in the audience gazed upon the work admiringly. Sexton, in particular, was captivated. The musicians haunted Sexton. She purchased one of the early versions from Swan and hung it first in her living room, then moved it to her study, where she would glance at it in between writing letters and typing poems. To her, it had a kind of magic, maybe a twinge of evil. So much of Swan's early work had been expressionist, but nonetheless figurative. This work, however, conjured figures only in the loosest sense. 
Sexton hadn't seen anything like this in Swan's other work, though she liked that work too, and would have bought more of it if she could have afforded it. Occasionally, she would stand up from her desk and sidle up to the lithograph, getting close to it, far closer than one is supposed to get to a work of art. She was looking for something, though she didn't know what, something that was inside the lithograph, she thought to herself, something that maybe wasn't even there. She started to write. As always, she started with images, old palaces, a piper who is also a midwife with an unforgettable woman's face, a flute that grows out of the wall like something human that is then driven into the wall like a pipe. She wasn't sure what she was describing. It wasn't music so much as magic, perhaps. The images piled up until she felt herself lost among them. She picked up the phone, as she always did when she felt lost, but instead of calling Maxine Cuman, her most frequently phoned friend and fellow poet, she called Swan. Sexton began to read out loud what she'd written. Swan, interested and perhaps amused, responded that she didn't quite know what Sexton was after, but she felt inspired herself. Perhaps she would draw something in response to Sexton's lines. Weeks later, on a May morning, Sexton sat in Cuman's breakfast nook, pleading with her more learned friend to provide her poem with an organizing myth. Wasn't there something about the great search for something in the middle of the earth? Cuman was the kind of poet who would start with a myth and write a poem, while Sexton would write a poem and then look for a myth to match. Cuman couldn't come up with anything. Sexton acknowledged that she didn't really know what she was looking for, or really what she was writing about. The poem itself was an incomplete quest. Sexton didn't publish this poem until 1966, when it appeared in her collection, Live or Die, the title taken from a line in Bellow. By then it had a new title, To Lose the Earth. But before she changed the title from the musicians, she read it aloud in May 1963 at an institute seminar. Before the seminar began, she hung Swan's musicians on the wall behind her. The audience could look at it as the poet read her work. Sexton made her typical apologies, in this case for the poem's length, as well as for the fact that it isn't a good reading poem. The women listened patiently, reading along with their mimeographed copies of the poem, and noting that Sexton must have made changes as recently as the night before. The women in the audience felt themselves addressed by the you of the poem. They were along for the ride into the bowels of the earth. The poem moves from the wreckage of Europe and the common market to a cave that a pharaoh built by the sea, where a musician plays his flute. There below ground, the dead protrude from the walls. Those who have found themselves in this underworld must try to decide if they want to leave, or even if they can. After all, the music is so enticing and the figure playing it so mysterious. There might be enough in this cave to entertain a visitor for a long time. When she finished reading, Sexton addressed Swan, who was listening from the front row. How about it, Barbara, she asked. Can we keep going forever? As if Sexton's question had been about their collaborative relationship rather than a particular poem, Swan responded by revealing both a painting and a drawing she had done based on the fragments she'd heard over the phone. One was called The Sorcerers. It was as if the figures from the musicians had shape, shape shifted in response to the music of Sexton's Piper. My paintings and drawings are extensions, Swan explained. There are images in your poem that I have yet to conjure with. She sounded like a sorcerer herself. Swan propped up her new work alongside the old. Her drawing seemed to be a continuation of Sexton's poem, a further evolution of the murky musician figure that had inspired the writing. It was as if the shapeshifter Sexton described in her poem, her musician, both a woman and a man, had transformed once again. Swan and Sexton were engaged in a strange artistic back and forth passing the musician figure between them and altering him as they did so. It's like incest, someone whispered. I'm skipping ahead a bit. It wasn't like incest in the end. Sexton and Swan came from two different traditions. Theirs was an exogamous love. They always remained a bit strange to each other through their time at the Institute and throughout their future collaborations of which there were many. Their friendship endured though, and depended on mutual misunderstanding. Barbara and Anne had one of the most beautiful relationships between women that I've ever seen, the writer Tilly Olson once said. With Barbara, Anne was her most natural, the way she must have been with her children. What Sexton and Swan shared was not a medium, but a sensibility. They understood how to inspire each other. 
and moved into my world like a tornado, Swan wrote years later. She shook it up, rattled it, possessed it like a demon. Swan knew that if she opened up a book about Edward Munch and showed Sexton the scream, Sexton would be fascinated. She appreciated the way Sexton wrought meaning from the murky textures of her painting. The creative mind deals with the world of imagination, Swan once explained. The artist and the poet carry this world around in their heads. They inhabit it. The scholar with a PhD can study this world, analyze it, criticize it, even try to recreate it in biography. But the scholar can never really know the crazy intuitive nonsense that whirls around the mind of an artist. This is the world in which Sexton and Swan lived with each other. Wow, Maggie, that was wonderful. Like uh, what wonderful, intelligent and amazing writing. Um, now I've got a few questions to ask you. So I uh, know a little bit of the backstory and we'll talk about that later about how the equivalents were drawn to each other, but what drew you to them to make this book? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a great question. Um, so, so I have two answers to it. So the first is my kind of professional scholarly intellectual answer. And the second is, is the more personal and probably truer answer. Um, so I've always been really interested in creative communities, in coteries, um, you know, Bloomsbury or the Transcendentalists or uh, the Black Mountain Institute. Um, and I'm, I have always been very curious about how these environments can foster collaboration, experimentation. And I think there's kind of a political component to my interest as well, which is, you know, I'm interested in, in collectivity <laughs> as, as a way of life, as a mode of thinking. And I think it's important to recognize that art is, you know, comes from individual experience, individual genius, even if we want to call it, but it's often made and enabled by communities. Um, it's the very rare person that can really go it alone in life without support and help from institutions, friends, family, wives, as, <laughs> as throughout history have been the real help meets of so many artists and intellectuals. Um, so, so that's part of what drew me to this institute as a place that was particularly important for women artists and writers and intellectuals that was trying to foster that kind of community. And then the personal reason is that when I started writing this book, I was living with three other women in a house in Somerville. And we've been there for a few years and we were all very close friends. We were writers, all of us with different sort of writing ambitions. And it felt like an, an ideal environment to live in because you could sit down over breakfast and show someone a pitch you were writing or you know, show someone the screenplay you were writing. And it was so proximate and intimate and complicated at times, but it also felt really temporary. It didn't feel like we were going to live the rest of our lives in this house in, you know, by the train tracks in Somerville. And so I was, I was kind of anxious about that loss, that loss that I knew was coming. And so I was looking for stories or historical moments or something that could kind of show me what this experience was like, how it could be recreated, um, something that could just kind of ease my anxiety about the temporariness of my of my home, of, of my home and my and my my friendships at the time. So so that's part of the thing that compelled me to to follow the the thread to the institute. Now in the early 60s when these these particular artists met one another. What was happening for people uh, much older than myself? They might need to be filled in. Uh, they don't need to be filled in. What was happening in the 60s, especially with, uh, with women? And uh, why did it all kind of come to fruition during the equivalence? Yeah, um, I always, yeah, I always feel um, funny answering this question when I'm talking to people who lived this experience, and maybe there are some people listening and watching right now who can say, I, I can answer this question better than someone, you know, who was born in the 1980s. But, um, but so, so this moment, this, this late 1950s, the book starts in 1957, it goes through 1974, huge cultural, political, and social changes happen during that time. Um, but I'm especially interested in this early moment early 60s, late 50s, which is this kind of hinge moment between um, the 1950s culture, which was a real, where, where there was a real emphasis on conformity, 
uh, the containment of communism, which also kind of meant containing deviance and uh, disruption. There was a real attention to the home and the nuclear family as important institutions for American culture. Um, I mean, this is a, a culture that I think has been represented in popular culture in our own day and in Mad Men and other kinds of TVs, shows and movies. But it was a really kind of straight laced cultural moment in America, a moment where, you know, political dissidence was criminalized, sexual deviance was criminalized, uh, abortion was illegal, birth control was illegal. Um, it was it, it was a, a really challenging moment for people who did not want to conform to the social roles that were available to them. And then we we know that in the late Bible, late 60s, this kind of there's an eruption of political and social revolution. But I was curious, and I've always been curious about the, the intermediate stage, how we get from the culture of the 50s to the culture of the late 60s. And, um, and I guess what I realized as I was researching this book, both that so much organizing had been going on way, way before the moment of revolution and had always been going on through the 30s, through the 40s, through the 50s, especially by people on the political left, especially by labor activists and civil rights activists. But then in this very early 1960s 60s moment, there were a lot of women who were thinking really seriously about how to reform or manage women's lives and to make their place in society um, more uh, a more sort of capacious place for them in in society and so even before we get you know the feminine mystique even before we get uh consciousness raising there were these kind of reformers who didn't really want to overthrow uh patriarchy in the way that some of their their um later uh the people who came later did but nevertheless ended up creating places like the Institute where a lot of revolutionary thinking and art was happening. So I, I guess that's the, the kind of hinge moment that I, that I found interesting. Um, we're, we're not yet at revolution. We're not yet at people in the streets, but there is, there is change happening. Well, that creator, Mary Ingraham Bunting, she researched the fact that many very educated women were not getting into places like Radcliffe because of the um, because of the uh, requirements and the degrees needed. So she was able to create, um, which is of course the title of your book, a way for women to get into Radcliffe. Um, can this still happen today, and or to such a power to, in, in a powerful in such a powerful way to other marginalized groups? That, yeah, that's a, that's a question that I've thought about a lot. And I think as I was I was finishing the book and I was thinking, you know, how many of these problems that people were working through at the time are still problems, right? So the the caring for children in America has always been a you know has been a problem for a long time. We were very close to getting some sort of federal uh, assistance with child care and then you know Nixon strikes it down in 72 or something like that. Um, but I, but I, I, was, I was thinking right so one of the one of the things that the Institute for Independent Study was able to do was recognize that you know women who are often charged with a lot of family responsibility, a lot of social responsibility need some kind of material support um, if they're going to fulfill, uh, have have lives outside the home. And of course, I should, you know, sort of acknowledge that this is not, there are sort of, um, you know, demographic and social class and racial factors that determine whether or not someone is, is working mostly outside the home, working mostly in the home, etc. But I do think, you know, as a general rule, more support for families is, is needed. And that was something the Institute was, was recognizing. But I don't know that this particular kind of support or the this kind of institution it would be the best fit now um i think the way we think about gender has changed a lot and the way we think about uh women as a category or woman as a category has changed a lot so to create a women's only space that kind of ends up catering mostly to white women or middle class or professional class women feels really limited in a way that I think in 1960, it was delimited, but it was also much more revolutionary or much more groundbreaking in some ways. So at I the think- time it was, 
Yeah, at the time it was called an experiment. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this, this, hadn't, this hadn't been done before. But now I think we know the problems with having women's only spaces that are limited in the kind of women that they assist or the kind of um, communities that they foster. And so I think what I what I take from the Institute as a kind of portable idea is this idea of institutional and material support that, you know, these women got paychecks, <laughs> they got they got twenty eight thousand dollars you know, a year. And and that is needed if you're going to be able to, you know, support a family, if you're going to be able to pay for child care, um, if you're going to have, you know, the means to achieve things that you want to achieve. So so that's kind of the the update that I would, you know, a universal basic, basic income or, or better, federally supported childcare. That might be the, the version that I would hope for for today. Yeah, the, the five main folks in your books, Anne Sexton and Maxine Keeman and Barbara Swan, Marianne Panetta and Tilly Olson. Now let's have fun with this one. Uh, I mean, they've all, they've all passed uh, by this point and, uh, if you had a chance to talk to one of them while writing this book, who would you have really wanted to have talked to? Oh man, wow. You can no, only I choose can... one. Yeah, <laughs> no. I've gotten versions of this question that are, who, who's the one you feel the most affinity for? Who are you most like? I've never gotten the one of who, who do you want to talk to? And so I, uh, I, I, the person who led me into the book was Tilly Olson. Um, she used my kind of moral compass guiding light, but I know that she was very shy. Um, this is why she, when she gave her lecture, she had all these note cards and she was, um, you know, giving, giving them in this really piecemeal fashion. So I think even though my, my conscience wants to say, go, go to your, you know, political guiding light and have a conversation with her. I think I would want to talk to Anne Sexton because she was such a surprise. You never sort of knew which what she was going to say, what she was going, where, what mood she was going to be in, where she was going to come from. And she, she loved people. She just, you know, loved talking to people. She loved reading. She loved performing. If she read something that she liked, she would immediately dash off a letter to the author, just say, hey, thank you so much for writing this. It really inspired me. She, she, she fed her cheese. I think I want to. I'm sorry, Maggie, you're cutting in it. You cut in and out of the very end of that question. Um, but I don't know where to pick it up again. So I'll just I'll just roll on by. Um, Sounds good. So uh, one review I read mentioned that the people that love Anne Sexton that might only be able to see her in that documentary when she basically was having a breakdown. Um, the review I read said that you were able to present to younger people, especially a side of Anne Sexton that they might not have even seen. So while you were writing the book, did you feel some sort of responsibility in that way? Mm. So there is, I, I, I don't know that I thought about it as a responsibility, but I think I was thinking about her as a friend. So the book is about relationships of friendship and artistic collaboration. And, you know, it's not, it's not a typical biography of any of these figures. It's not a cradle to grave biography. I don't write that much about their husbands, for instance, you know, I don't write that much about their marriages. And I think with that angle on Sexton, just different qualities of hers emerged because she was a generous friend. She was an engaged friend. She was um, a creative friend collaborative friend and that is, is a wife, um, has a daughter. Uh, and so that's, I think, partly what, what the version of her that came out is sort of the version she was to her, her friends, I suppose. I think part of Sexton's um, connection with Tilly Olsen is she wrote a letter to Tilly about a short story that Tilly Olsen wrote that really moved Tilly Olsen and had them connect. Um, is that something that still happens with women's writers and is getting an email from someone the same as getting a letter sent across the country? I'm tempted to say it's pretty similar and I think it does still happen. 
Um, I definitely write to people when I read something of theirs that I admire and people write to me. And um, I have had friendships form that way. Um, I'm seeing someone, meeting someone in person for the first time next week who, or in two weeks who's writing I admire and who's, who's read my writing and we, we're going to be in the same city and we'll, we'll meet up. And it's, you know, I think, I think this does still happen and maybe it's even easier to write that email or find someone on social media or something like that. Um, Do you wish to name drop who that wonderful writer is? <laughs> oh, um, uh, sure. Jo Joanna Biggs, who's, um, who's, who's written something recently about Sylvia Federici and uh, the wages for housework movement um, that I really enjoyed. Oh, that's awesome. Um, so uh, I'm going to wrap up with a final question here. Um, so what would be the equivalent of the equivalence today? Hmm. Another... You need to answer that thinking about people, places, or things. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I think I'm, I'm tempted to think of, of the various women I know who are friends with each other and who I envy and admire. Um, uh, and they're, they're sort of creative circles. Um, but I think there's a lot of a lot of them. I guess is may, maybe this is the way to answer your question. I think there's not just one group anymore, one place or one institution. I think you know the social changes have enabled a lot of those different circles to form, such that it's it's hard to pinpoint just one. That there's 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 many versions of the equivalence now. Um, so much. You the think it's yeah. because of social social media and the internet has allowed that to happen. Uh, I, I guess I, I, I was thinking more in terms of, um, you know, gender equality that, you know, rather than it being in the 1950s, where once a woman was married, she was kind of expected to prioritize her, her marriage and her family and not seek out these kind of rich, creative friendships. Um, I think that's, that's, that expectation is not there in the same way. Uh, so there's more of an opportunity for fostering these kind of uh, intimacies. I agree. So I was thank you. It was so great to hear you and you talk about the book. And uh, the book is, if people are interested, there's the cover. And uh, you can find it at Penguin Random House. You can order it right there. Um, and there's various ordering places. $16.95. That's what I like to say. See, I reached the point after all this stimulating conversation, I just feel like a car salesman. For $16.99, if you act now, probably the store will throw in a free bookmark. So um, what is your favorite uh, independent bookstore that people can maybe shop online or even go to these days? Uh, I, I am a member of the Harvard Bookstore in Harvard Square and they do do online shipping. So definitely check them out. Fantastic, thank you so much. And Thank uh, you so much. Yeah, thanks for, thanks for having me. Thanks for being here um, and enjoy the rest of your evening. All right. And uh, folks that are watching on the stream, if you'd like to come on in now and use the link and join us at the open mic, uh, feel free. And you're very welcome. If not, thank you for coming and watching the feed. Thank you.